Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us in today's session. I am Celeste, a fintech analyst with SNP, and together with my colleague Sampath, we will be sharing about the emerging risk and opportunities in the APEC fintech space. So we will be dividing the presentation into two sections. I will start off by providing a big picture of the state of APEC fintech funding so far, highlighting key areas and business models that VCs are interested in, as well as sharing our outlook for the subsequent period. In the next part of the presentation, Sampath will take a deeper dive into the payment space, delving deep into our cashless payments outlook in Southeast Asia, and identifying risk and opportunities for payment fintechs in the region. Now, in the last 10 minutes of the presentation, we will be hosting a QA and a session. So feel free to type in your questions in the question box, and we'll try to address as many of those as possible. Now, let me first start off the session by looking at fintech funding over the past couple of years. Now, at the onset of the pandemic, fintech funding in APEC was negatively impacted with dollar amount raised declining by nearly one third in 2020 and deal activity falling by roughly one fifth. Now, moving on to 2021, that was a different story altogether because VCs are starting to see that digital habits picked up during the peak of the pandemic are likely here to stay and fintechs will naturally be a big beneficiary of that. So 2021 was really a record funding year for APEC fintechs. Funding raised more than doubled to over 15 billion and deal activity rose by over 80% to 754 deals. So naturally, this was a tough act to follow and pace of fintech funding this year in terms of both dollar amount raised as well as deal activity have so far fallen short of last year's level. But still, it is proving to be fairly resilient amid the market pullback and macro headwinds. In the first half this year, fintechs in APEC drew in 6.7 billion, which has already surpassed the pandemic lows in 2020 where just 5.9 billion was raised in the entire year. The pace of fintech funding this year is also well above pre-pandemic levels. Um, but having said that, you know, we saw that fundraising activity had actually declined in the second quarter this year. So that may be a sign that a slowdown is just around the corner. Now, when we look at the number of mega deals over the past couple of years, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. When we look at the number of mega deals over the past couple of years, it paints a similar picture that fintech funding this year has been somewhat resilient. Now, in the first half of the year, there were 14 mega rounds. And although this was nowhere near last year's levels where there were 41 large transactions, it is really more than what we saw in 2019 and 2020, where there were just 11 rounds for the entire year. But when we zoom into mega rounds as a percentage of total funding value, it, however, gives us a sense that we're headed for a slowdown in the funding environment. So much like what we saw in 2020, mega rounds in the first half this year accounted for just 41% of total funding value. Now, for comparison purposes, last year's figures stood at 55%. So what this tells us is that investors are, are turning more conservative and perhaps a little bit more selective with their deal choices and are therefore cutting smaller check sizes. Now, let us look at where VCs are investing. Um, in the past, fintech funding in APEC was dominated by Indian and Chinese fintechs, but investors have started turning away from Chinese fintechs since regulators started cracking down on the tech industry. So even though China has since signaled plans to sort of ease scrutiny on tech firms, VCs are generally still approaching Chinese tech companies with some level of caution. So we think that funding to Chinese fintechs could remain depressed for a while. But India as a destination still sort of remains attractive to VCs. In the first half this year, Indian fintechs raised 2.4 billion, or roughly 36% of total funding. Increasingly, though, we are seeing VCs allocating more money to Southeast Asia-based fintechs because um, they are generally optimistic on the region's fast-growing digital economy as well as the expanding middle-class population. Now, in the first half this year, Southeast Asian fintechs raised roughly 3 billion accounting for 44% of total funding. And within Southeast Asia, Singapore and Indonesia are the two markets that typically see the most amount of funding. So in recent times, we have also seen VCs launching substantial funds that are targeted at Southeast Asia and India's startups. Sequoia Capital, for example, has just launched a 2 billion India fund and 850 million Southeast Asia fund in June. And Jungle Ventures closed a 600 million fund 
dedicated to Southeast Asia and India's startup is in, in May. So going forward, we think that India and Southeast Asia fintechs will likely continue to lead funding in the APEC region. Now, in terms of fintech segments, payment companies have traditionally dominated funding in APEC, and that is still the case. So payment fintechs actually drew in $2.4 in the first half this year, contributing to one-third of total funding. But VCs have been allocating more capital to digital lenders, which was the hardest hit fintech category at the height of the pandemic, because back then, there was the broader fear that lending up starts would be hit by a wave of loan defaults, since many of the underwriting engines haven't yet been tested through a full credit cycle. But lending fintechs you know, that have emerged from the pandemic on a stronger footing might have spurred the return of investors' confidence. So one example being Oxizo, uh, which raised one of the largest fundraising rounds this year. Um, so Oxizo is an India-based small business lender that raised $200 million in a Series A round. Um, and this Oxizo has seen swift growth over the past two years, with assets under management growing by 2.8 times between financial year 2020 and 2022. And this growth was in fact achieved while maintaining a low non-performing uh, assets ratio of 1.25%. So for reference, India's scheduled commercial banks ratio at that time was roughly 6.9%. So the strong growth of such lenders likely added to investors' confidence. Now, in the first half of the year, digital lenders attracted $2, two billion, or roughly 28% of total funding. Um, but having said that, you know, investors' optimism in this sector could be short-lived if recessionary fears and a rising rate environment dampens loan demand. Now, the investment tax segment is another category that has seen some increase in funding over the years. Um, and that is, in fact, the category that saw the largest number of deals in the second quarter this year a significant number of which actually came from fintechs in the crypto space. Of the 61 investment tech deals closed in the second quarter, at least 24 were raised by fintechs offering services in the crypto and digital asset space. But with the weakening of crypto market and news of troubled crypto lenders running to liquidity issues or filing for bankruptcy, we think that deal activity in the investment tech sector is due for a slowdown in subsequent periods. Now, in terms of funding mix by deal stages, there doesn't seem to be a significant shift in terms of proportion by deal volume so far, but venture dollars to mature fintechs appears to be on a decline, while more capital is being allocated to growth stage fintechs, which accounted for nearly half the total amount raised in the first half this year. Now, there are a few reasons for this in our opinion. So first of all, private market tends to lack public market but funding for late-stage companies with high valuations tend to be more sensitive to a public market correction. So this could really be a situation where mature fintechs are being affected first by the market sell-off. Now, the second reason is that a, large, a few large consumer fintechs like Grab, Paytm, Kakao Bank, Kakao Pay, as well as GoTo Group have gone public recently, um, so they are no longer included in private fundraising transactions. Now, a few of these companies had in fact led some of the largest funding rounds in the past, so their exclusion from the data set might have also contributed to this shift in proportion by deal maturity. But on the whole, we think that late-stage companies are still in a fairly good position to raise fresh funding because they are considered to be safer bets in the current environment. Now, another trend that we are seeing is that funding allocated to B2B models has risen prominently. In the first half this year, B2B fintechs accounted for over 75% of dollar amount raised. Now, again, part of this shift may be due to the fact that a few large consumer fintechs had gone public recently. So that sort of skews the funding mix towards B2B companies. But we think a bigger reason is that VCs are turning cautious in this prolonged market downturn and economic uncertainty. So they generally prefer companies that have demonstrated greater financial discipline. Now, since B2B companies tend to operate on a lower cash burn model than consumer-facing fintechs, investors are naturally more inclined to invest in B2B firms. Now, if we look at the top-funded fintechs in the first half this year, it is quite clear that VCs are pumping more money into fintechs that offer services to other businesses. So in the payment space, for example, a substantial amount of money is going to payment gateways that facilitate online transactions for merchants. In the lending space, uh, likewise, digital lenders that target the small business segment saw larger funding routes. And again, in the investment tech segment, Amber Group is actually a tech vendor 
that offers digital asset services. Um, and, and also they are, they are one of the few that saw the largest fundraise within the segment. So really, how are these fintechs spending all the newly raised cash? Now, in a period of economic uncertainty, we generally expect fintechs to go into cash preservation mode. But it looks like some of the well-capitalized fintechs are still keen in pursuing inorganic growth, either for product or geography expansion purposes. Um, and some of these acquisitions are perhaps more opportunistic in, a, in nature. So in Indonesia, for example, we have seen a growing number of fintechs investing in some of the smaller local banks. So Zendit and funding societies are perhaps some of the more recent examples. Um, and part of the reason is really because some of these smaller banks need additional capital injection by end of this year because of the newly raised core capital requirement that's set by the Financial Services Authority. So fintechs were essentially, with presence in Indonesia, were essentially leveraging on this opportunity to sort of gain a foothold in the banking space, uh, which could provide them with further opportunities to offer a wider range of financial services. Now, overall, what is our outlook for fintech funding in APEC? So although financing to fintechs in APEC has so far appeared to be fairly resilient, declining deal activity, growing layoffs at fintechs, and the recent closure of Australia's vote bank due to a lack of fresh funding, essentially, essentially suggests that we are look, likely looking at a harsher funding climate in the second half of the year. Now, adding to that, market cap of recently listed fintechs in APEC have also been hit hard by the broader market. So Grab, for instance, you know, it, it, it was in a spotlight for being the largest ever fintech spec merger at a valuation of 40 billion. But they have since seen their share price tumbling by over 80% since the announcement of the spec merger. So the poor performance of listed fintechs will likely affect VC's appetite for investments in the upcoming periods as well. Now, as venture capital slows, a few things could happen in our view. So first of all, Debt financing could be an alternative avenue for fintechs to raise cash to weather the funding winter. A number of APEC-focused uh, venture debt firms like Mars, Growth Capital, and Innovant Capital have actually been actively raising funds in recent times, so that could perhaps help support the financing of startups in the region. Now, secondly, as funding dries up, we do expect to see some level of consolidation, particularly in the payment space, where the bulk of funding Tend to, be, um, tend to flow disproportionately to a small handful of players. And likewise, in the crypto market, we expect to see consolidation as troubled crypto lenders may either be forced to shut down their operations or sell their distressed assets. So as we saw earlier, some of the well-capitalized B2B fintechs are still seeking inorganic growth. So this could provide some buying opportunities for them. Now, lastly, B2C fintechs, which are generally looked upon less favorably in the current climate, may expand into B2B services in an attempt to improve their unit economics. So we will be hearing more about this from the payments perspective in the next part of the presentation. Over to you, Sampath. Uh, thanks for that insightful presentation, Celeste. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. During the next 15 minutes, I'm going to cover our outlook for payments and payment revenues in Southeast Asia, with a particular focus on four countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. I'll also discuss how large technology companies are diversifying into other financial services and essentially turning into digital banking surrogates. Now, let's first take a quick look at, uh, at the most recent trends. Cashless transactions are growing at breakneck speed across the Southeast Asian region. Uh, but the main highlight has been uh, Thailand, which is, which in our opinion is a vastly underappreciated fintech market and has seen one of the fastest growth, growth rates in the APAC region, perhaps matched only by India. Among Southeast Asian countries in our review, Thailand is certainly the fastest growing payments market. Singapore's cashless adoption usage levels are the highest in Southeast Asia and, in, and the market continues to register steady growth on a large base. Indonesia on the far end of the spectrum has been somewhat underwhelming. Now, how should one know which markets offer growth potential for fintechs and which markets do not? One way to determine that is to see what type of cashless payment models are becoming popular. So we have identified three uh, popular payments models in the Southeast Asian region. 
The first one is the traditional card model, which comprises debit and credit cards. The second one is the interbank transfers, which are increasingly catching on in the region, wherein customers can uh, instantly move money between bank accounts using their mobile phones. Well, we know that the first two models are run by banks, meaning that uh, banks uh, typically issue payment services and hold direct relationships with consumers. But the third one, which is the electronic money framework, offers opportunities for non-banks such as fintechs to issue prepaid cards and reloadable mobile wallets. It's important to note that cards and e-money models drive payment revenues for banks and fintechs. And as of now, while interbank transfers are gaining popularity and they are being driven by real-time payment systems, they are, in our opinion, uh, either revenue neutral or do not generate any revenues. And we are going to be focusing uh, during this presentation primarily on expected growth trends in electronic money and uh, cards because payment revenue growth uh, is typically linked to these two payment instruments. Now, let's look at uh, why we believe e-money is a proxy for fintech payments in Southeast Asia. So uh, across the region, you know, like I said before, uh, e-money uh, along with other payments are uh, gaining popularity. But what is really interesting about e-money is that uh, it really provides uh, an entry point for technology firms to uh, offer financial services. And what we have seen is that non-banks are increasingly accounting for the majority of e-money license holders in most markets. It has become really imperative for technology firms to provide their consumers with uh, access to a viable instrument to perform digital tra transactions. For a large number of technology firms, uh, the e-money framework really allows them to operate in the financial services without the burden of bank-like regulations. As a reminder, e-money competes with cards as a payment method for retail purchases, both online as well as offline. Now let's look at uh, the futuristic trends. So the two charts on this slide should really help us uh, put the FinTech opportunity in perspective. Uh, this is a reminder, e-money is the proxy for uh, FinTech payments. So what the data on this slide show is that uh, FinTech wallets are already more widely used than cards. But in terms of transaction values, we do not really expect them to surpass cards in the near future. All those uh, e-money uh, you know, are certainly uh, outpacing cards. Uh, card usage tends to support purchases at uh, large retail establishments, whereas uh, e-money more prominently features in everyday low ticket size transactions. We expect aggregate card value in the Ford markets to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 3% to reach about $253 billion by 2025. Uh, E-money, on the other hand, is expected to register a much higher CAGR of 11% to reach $76 billion. Now, why should these projections matter? And, and uh, the, perhaps the bigger question is, how do they translate into payment revenues? So let's look at uh, our projections for payment revenues. Now, issuer revenues for, from payments uh, are expected to grow at, uh, at a tardy CAGR of just about 4% uh, to touch nearly $4 billion in 2025. Now, we define uh, payment issuer revenues as a portion of the merchant fees that uh, goes to banks and non-banks issuing payments instruments such as cards and e-money. We believe that banks will bear the greater burden, greater brunt of the revenue slowdown. We expect banks in the four countries to see their aggregate interchange revenue grow at just about 2% uh, every year to touch uh, just over $3 billion in 2025. We, uh, while fintechs will certainly lead the payment revenue growth, the aggregate revenue opportunities are not really large enough uh, for uh, you know, financial technology companies that have been, uh, uh, especially those that have been raising, uh, you know, uh, huge amounts and commanding large valuations. We expect money revenues, uh, e-money revenues to rise by over 13% CAGR to $905 million from just about $544 million in 2021. Now let's uh, look at 
which are the you know look, look at the critical markets for banks and fintechs to grow payment revenues well like i said before you know the southeast asian region uh, has become very important for uh, banks and fintechs uh, especially for those that are building uh, you know regional businesses of uh, we believe that growth opportunities still vary from country to country singapore continues to be the best bet for uh, card issuers to grow interchange revenues we forecast interchange revenues on debit and credit card transactions in singapore to grow at a kgr of 3% malaysia on the other hand is expected to see its card revenue shrink every year about 3% largely driven by regulatory pressure on interchange rates for fintechs uh, in our opinion indonesia offers the highest revenue potential as electronic money primarily wallets are increasingly becoming the country's primary payments instrument the aggregate e money value in the country surpassed credit cards for the first time in 2021 we expect indonesia's e money revenues to nearly double to 416 million dollars in 2025 from 225 million dollars in 2021 Thailand uh, in our view will be the second highest revenue pool for fintechs with its revenues on e-money transactions expected to rise at a kgr of 13% to reach 365 million dollars in 2025 now looking at uh, leading fintech players uh, we have grab c and ant group which are among the Uh, you know e-money companies with the largest geographical footprint uh, offering payments in at least six countries in uh, southeast asia now uh, these companies have e-money licenses to operate payments in most of the markets their wide reach allows them to provide financial services to large underbank populations while these companies may differ in how they are assembling financial services Uh, what we have seen is that uh, c grab and go to have a more hands on approach and have certainly shown uh, a great enthusiasm toward risk bearing models by uh, you know either acquiring uh, banking licenses or uh, picking up stakes in banks whereas the ant group and the alibaba ecosystem typically leans on a collaboration model wherein uh, the portfolio companies will try not to step on each of the stores so if a portfolio company in the ecosystem holds a banking license uh, we would typically see the other portfolio companies you know leaning on this entity holding the license overall uh, we believe that we will increasingly see a growing uh, convergence between digital commerce and banking uh, in south east asia and we believe that affiliation with uh, technology platforms could be very critical to the future of both freshly minted digital banks and the incumbent uh, incumbents so let's now look at uh, how you know uh, these large platforms will uh, look to put their bank licenses to work by taking the example of c which operates a very popular e-commerce platform called shopee across south east asia so uh, we are you know we we are seeing uh, shopee engaging consumers and merchants through banking services you know so this slide uh, provides uh, you know a snapshot of various payments and financial services uh, aimed at consumers as well as merchants so c uh, could uh, actually use its licenses to bring a lot of financial services in house and bring down its transaction processing costs and reduce payment friction for shops it could bridge the gap with large competitors you know in certain markets in terms of providing financial services to its users for example in singapore it does not you know currently offer co-branded credit cards so c could also uh, shore up its online point of sale financing uh, point of sale financing plans for uh, large ticket purchases on the merchant side you know troves are troves of seller data could uh, could well fuel c's underwriting engine and uh, that could help c to provide working capital to merchants now uh, and we also believe that uh, you know 
sees uh, banking licenses could well make uh, its uh, you know current uh, banking partnerships become redundant while shopee will likely remain open to other banking customers uh, it may well guide its consumers and merchants to switch to in-house banking products we also believe that c could leverage uh, it's you know the same technology stack for all its digital banks in the region which could allow it to create a regional digital bank footprint in a, a cost efficient manner and let's now look at uh, c's financials and uh, which you know which uh, provide a good illustration of how fintechs can seek to improve profitability by expanding into adjacent financial services such as lending we believe that c grows uh, you know uh, revenues in two ways one by increasing the total digital total digital payment volume process through its uh, through its platform another way to generate higher revenue is by improving the transaction take rate uh, the transaction take rate is nothing but uh, revenues as a percentage of total payment volume what we are witnessing is that you know c is earning a greater piece of purchases on its platform as as more and more consumers are are using its higher margin financial products so for example in indonesia about 30% of its active users in the first quarter of 2022 used multiple financial products offered by c money overall c's quarterly uh, total payment volume increased to uh, about 150% year over year in the first quarter of 2022 but its revenues on the other hand jumped uh, you know registered a much higher growth rate at about 300% uh, which uh, was largely driven by increasing transaction take rate for c as well as other fintechs maximizing uh, revenue take rate is very important for their fintech businesses to turn around and generate profits of which uh, in the case of c as well as grab or or, or other large technology platforms counting on uh, banking licenses uh, you know is well dependent on putting those banking licenses to work and uh, you know cross selling their uh, other financial services to their large and uh, you know, fast growing user base now moving on to the uh, final slide so to recap sellers point about consolidation of you know we are, we are seeing uh, that uh, uh, we currently have too many companies holding electronic money licenses while uh, most of the you know e-money transactions are held by a handful of players uh, which clearly suggests that uh, consolidation is the need of the hour we believe that uh, most fintechs are currently not generating uh, positive margins even on a transaction level as payment revenues are often not enough to uh, you know meet uh, processing costs incurred for drawing customer funds into their stored value wallets fintechs with insignificant uh, market position in e money could become acquisition candidates especially those that struggle to raise capital others might shift their gaze towards you know to uh, much and acquiring activities while there is some potential uh, you know to generate uh, higher margin revenues by providing software and services for improving payments performance and accelerating turnover through uh, loyalty programs with that our prepared remarks end and the q&a session session begins um, i am already seeing a couple of questions uh, which we will address uh, but uh, me- meanwhile please keep sending questions and we will will be happy to answer them if there is time so there is a question about the venture capital environment uh, it is for you celeste and the question is now that uh, interest rates are on rise would it be conducive for uh, fintechs to raise venture debt right uh, thanks abbas right um so although debt financing it's sort of in a rise in, in a rising rate environment um could mean higher interest payments um 
raising equity capital in the current environment could arguably be more expensive because you know we have seen how tech stock valuations have fallen significantly. So this will no doubt lead to a corresponding revaluation in the private markets. And to some extent, I think you know this is already happening. So Klarna, for example, saw its valuation uh, being cut by 85% in its recent funding round. And Strike has also trimmed its internal valuation by roughly 28%. So startups attempting to raise equity capital in the current environment may face the potential of a down round and that could expose um, their founders or their current stakeholders to significant dilution. So turning to venture debt could be uh, one way to sort of extend their cash runway while minimizing equity dilution. So in Q2, we have actually seen some fintechs um, relying more on venture debt, actually. So Stashfin, for example, um, out of the $270 million that they raised in their Series C round, $200 million was actually um, raised via debt financing. Right, great. And uh, we have another question, uh, which is which is about uh, you know policy trends uh, in Southeast Asia and whether or not you know uh, whether they are improving or restricting the markets for fintechs in Southeast Asia. Uh, I can answer this question, uh, and uh, you know with respect to payments and to some extent uh, digital banking as well. Well, so regulators in Southeast Asia are. Uh, in our op opinion, trying to you know, maintain a fine balance between expanding the provision of uh, financial services and uh, uh, you know, preempting or, or uh, eliminating the threat of uh, disintermediation for banks. Uh, so by that, uh, you know, what I mean is that central banks in, in, in the region are uh, uh, facilitating the rise of tech-based financial intermediaries to creating tech-focused policy frameworks. Uh, E-Money, uh, you know, certainly is a very good example. And, uh, and, and the ongoing rollout of digital banking frameworks in several markets is uh, another excellent example. Some, some countries, uh, you know, on the other hand, like some countries like Indonesia, are uh, encouraging long-term alignments between um, technology companies and banks by letting technology companies pick up states and banks. So we, we're seeing... Uh, you know, uh, several examples of uh, uh, digital wallets turning into digital banking accounts through these partnerships. At the same time, central banks are also pushing banks to modernize their, you know, financial plumbing. So real-time payments systems like PromPay in, Tha in Thailand and uh, PayNow in Singapore offer uh, great examples of how banks can uh, stay relevant in, uh, you know, in consumer banking. One risk central banks uh, around the world are uh, really wary of is, is the risk of technology companies, you know, building closed loop financial networks, uh, you know, like, like what, we are, uh, what we've seen in China, for example. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, uh, on the contrary, uh, offers uh, a counter example of how you can uh, promote innovation and interoperability without, you know, stifling technology companies by, uh, you know, implementing uh, certain uh, initiatives such as uh, standardized QR codes and, and also encouraging interlinks between banks and fintechs through the use of APIs. Uh, we have a, a couple more questions. So we can, uh, we probably have time to take one more. Uh, so there is a question about uh, if there is a particular reason why uh, Indonesia and Thailand are more active in e-money transactions than other Southeast Asia countries, Southeast Asian countries. Well, the answer is uh, that, uh, you know, uh, first of all, if you uh, historically, you know, Indonesia and Thailand compared to Singapore and, uh, you know, just to, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Malaysia, you know, have been uh, uh, underbanked markets uh, on a relative basis. And uh, these two countries uh, have not really had uh, robust, you know, traditional uh, banking uh, infrastructure such as, uh, you know, access to card and other uh, payment services. 
So uh, in the absence of uh, traditional, you know, banking uh, payment infrastructure, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, non-banking services trying to fill the void simply because uh, regulators uh, have uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but around the world, figured out that uh, electronic money services provide a low cost way of servicing, you know, underbanked uh, population. So uh, uh, there is a historical, you know, reason why e-money is doing well in uh, Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, and, you know, this is more so in Indonesia where we are, uh, you know, we, we, we're seeing cards uh, not really taking off, uh, whereas Thailand, uh, on the other hand, you know, is, you know, is seeing uh, a diverse uh, mix of uh, payment in, payments instruments becoming popular. So while in Thailand, uh, electronic money is certainly becoming popular, we're also seeing cards and, uh, you know, uh, interbanks, interbank transfers, primarily uh, prompt pay transfers, also becoming uh, really popular. Uh, whereas Indonesia, as of now, is really running on, uh, you know, one engine, which is electronic money, uh, driven by these large technology platforms offering wallets. But, uh, you know, let me remind that uh, Thai, uh, Indonesia has also, uh, you know, launched its own real-time payment system recently. So it remains to be seen uh, how, you know, uh, Indonesia's, uh, whether or not Indonesia's uh, uh, real-time payment system, uh, uh, which goes by the name, uh, you know, uh, BI Indonesia, whether it would take off or not, uh, but going by, you know, what we are, what we have seen in other markets, uh, uh, we could, we might very well see, uh, you know, Indonesia's uh, instant interbank uh, system covering, uh, you know, banking uh, platforms to perhaps see some traction in mobile mobile banking transactions. Uh, there is also, uh, you know, another question about. Uh, you know, what's our view on, uh, you know, fintechs and whether they can improve margins and be more sustainable in the future? Uh, so I guess I can answer that question partly. And, uh, and Celeste, if you have any thoughts on that, please do, you know, feel free to chip in. So uh, in our views, fintechs, uh, you know, it's a, it's going to be a tough act to, you know, uh, see any turnaround in the near future simply because uh, like we said before you know the traditional fintech margins traditional fintech revenues you know are not really significant enough in southeast asia so uh, to to make a comparison you know unlike in the us where uh, you know uh, fintech companies can really uh, leverage uh, the large, uh, you know, very prominent interchange model that works in the U.S. Uh, in Asian markets, uh, you know, the interchange market is very small. So therefore, it's really imperative for fintechs to discover, uh, you know, adjacent uh, revenues uh, and uh, uh, you know what uh, and and uh, based on evidence. Uh, we have not really seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, many fintechs uh, make the transformation, make the pivot uh, successfully as yet. And added to that, we also have these large technology platforms, you know, digital conglomerates, uh, also operating in, uh, you know, financial services, uh, you know, basically using fintech to propel their other businesses, and there are. You know, they are in a position to partly subsidize their payments and fintech businesses uh, and, and whether, uh, you know, the lack of uh, uh, positive margins, the, la the lack of uh, profits. So it's going to be a tough act, uh, especially for uh, independent fintechs to stay, uh, you know, to, to uh, see a turnaround anytime soon. Uh, you know, and uh, that said, uh, you know, we, as, as, as the market uh, is poised for uh, continued growth. You know, uh, there are certainly there is certainly room for uh, for fintechs to you know get into uh, some uh, you know profitable uh, niches, uh, especially on the merchant acceptance side. Like I said before, you know, wherein they could help merchant uh, merchants of uh, you know 
uh, increase their payments performance and their and their their buy uh, be in a position to perhaps uh, you know generate uh, higher margins. Uh, sellers, uh, any any quick thoughts on this question? Yeah, thanks, Sampath. Uh, just to add on very quickly, um, you know, as as we shared earlier, we do expect to see some consolidation in the fintech industry uh, going forward. So I think that should help, you know, fintechs um, gain, fintechs that survive, of course, you know, would be in a position to capture a bigger market share as well. Uh, so with skill, you know, it also helps to uh, sort of move fintechs closer to the tipping point uh, towards a more sustainable operations. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Celeste. And uh, with that, uh, our presentation ends. Thanks, everyone, for joining.